good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad that you're able to join us on this virtual Black History celebration. Glad that you're going to be a part of that, indeed. And let's open this uh, celebration with a prayer. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, we come before you on this holy Sunday afternoon, seeking what only you can give as a blessing upon us. As we remember the black history of our forefathers and mothers and others who have gone before us and have in so many ways set the stage for us to continue in that great path, which was led by Jesus Christ. Guide us by the power of your Holy Spirit in all that we do in this celebration of our black history. Lift us up, we pray by the power of your presence and above all, bless all who participate in this celebration. All of this, we thankfully ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior and our Lord, let us all say, amen. Amen. Goodness. So glad that you're able to join us. What I'm going to do at this point is introduce uh, Dr. Sharon Rogers, who is going to actually lead us through the most part of this uh, great <laughs> celebration and, and guide us. So I turn it over to you, Dr. Rogers. All righty. Well, thank you. And good afternoon to everyone. And welcome to Christ the King Episcopal Church's Black History Program. Many thanks to Christ the King family for all of the good work that you're doing in our community. We especially want to thank and commend Martha Johnson and Helen Baylock for their hard work in organizing our program filled with spoken word and beautiful music as we salute our history makers. Brandy McLeod is gifting us with a trifecta this afternoon. First, she is the great granddaughter of Dr. Mary Jane McLeod Bethune Mm. a world-renowned educator, civil and human rights leader, and champion for women and young people. She's also the founder of Bethune College and an astute advisor to five of our United States presidents. Through it all, Dr. Bethune relied on faith and prayer for guidance and inspiration. She was famous for saying, without faith, nothing <laughs> is possible with faith, nothing is impossible. Secondly, Brandy's selection today entitled Prayer is the work of poet Langston Hughes, who thirdly granted H. Leslie Adams, a composer who holds a PhD in music, formal permission to set forth the words of prayer to music. And here's Brandy. Hello, my name is Brandy McLeod and I will be singing Prayer by H. Leslie Adams from his uh, song cycle called Night. Hope you enjoy. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Brandy. How simply beautiful. We are struck by the lyricism and beauty of this. And now we're gonna reflect on some good trouble with Dr. Joe Stewart, Justice and Noble Townsend. Good afternoon. My name is John Robert Lewis. I was born on February 21st, 1940 in a town near Troy, Alabama. During my lifetime, I was known as an American politician, a statesman, a civil rights activist and leader. I served in the United States House of Representatives for Georgia's fifth congressional district from 1987 until my death in 2020. I was chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as SNCC from 1963 to 1966. I was one of the big six leaders of groups who organized the 1963 March on Washington. I fulfilled many key roles in the civil rights movement and its actions to end racial segregation in the United States. In 1965, at the age of 25, I led the first of three Selma to Montgomery marches across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. As we tried to cross the bridge, state troopers attacked us to stop us. Many of us were injured, including me, as I received a fractured skull. But before the ambulance driver could take me away to the hospital, I called to the newscasters to remind President Lyndon B. Johnson of the importance of getting that Voters' Right Act passed. This incident became known as Bloody Sunday. As a result of this heightened awareness, the landmark Voting Rights Act was passed into law August 6, 1965. As a member of the Democratic Party, I served 17 terms in the United States House of Representatives, and as such, I became the Dean of the Georgia Congressional District and one of the leaders of the Democratic Party. I served as Chief Deputy Whip from 1991 and Senior Chief Deputy Whip from 2003. During my tenure, I received many honorary degrees and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I was known for getting into good trouble, but you know, our struggle is not over. And so I need to challenge you, my brothers and sisters, to go out and get into some good trouble. I play for the Miami Heat, Los Angeles Lakers, and the Cleveland Cavaliers. I have four NBA MVPs, four NBA championships, and I hold the record for the most playoff points. I use my stats to take on important issues and affect change. I started a partnership with the University of Akron to provide scholarships for over 2,300 students. And starting this year, I built the I Promise schools to help children stay in school. My name is LeBron James and I make good trouble. I play for the San Francisco 49ers as a backup quarterback. I led the team to their first Super Bowl appearance since 1994. In 2016, I knelt to protest racial injustice, police brutality, and systematic oppression in the country. I, I am a free agent, but no team has hired me because of my protests. I am Colin Kaepernick, and I'm in good trouble. Celebrating Black History Month with Christ the King Church.
Thank you, thank you, Dr. Joe and our distinguished guests, Noble and Justice Townsend, grandsons of Janet Webster. We are so proud of the good trouble you presented of effective change, awarding scholarships, building schools and demonstrating peacefully. Now, a colorblind society, a colorblind society has race neutral governmental policies that reject discrimination in any form to promote the goal of racial equality. Betty Bollard will share how this was important to the civil rights movement. And immediately following Betty, we invite you to enjoy classically trained soprano, Philora Williams. My name is Viola Liuzzo. I was born in Pennsylvania in 1925, but my family was poor and we moved around a lot. Most of my childhood was spent in Georgia and Tennessee. I saw firsthand the racial injustices that African Americans suffered. In 1943, my family moved to Detroit there, the tension between the whites and the blacks is very high. When I saw how blacks were being treated, it all in. really upset me. I think I was socially and politically active then. And I also became good friends with the African-American cashier in our local grocery store. In fact, it was she who was to join the NAACP after Bloody Sunday. Yes, but I 600 people marching for voting rights tried to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. They were blocked by the police, and when they refused to turn around, fighting broke out. More than 50 protesters were hospitalized that day, and some of them in critical condition. Two days later, when a second march to cross the bridge also failed, I knew I had to become more involved. And when a third march was called later that week, I drove down to Al Alabama to help. Once there, I joined with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and began transporting marches between Selma and Montgomery. I was driving a marcher back to Montgomery after the march when a car pulled next to ours and a member of the Ku Klux Klan shot me in the head. I was only 39 at the time, and I became the only known white woman to have been killed during the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Roy Wilkins, James Farmer, they were among the civil rights leaders who attended my funeral. Soon after, I'm happy to say, at the urging of President Lyndon Johnson, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 finally became law. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, my name. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? Sounds like Jesus. Somebody's calling my name. Sounds like Jesus. Somebody's calling my name. Sounds just like Jesus. Somebody's calling my name. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do? Soon one morning, death come a-creeping in my room. Soon one morning, death come a-creeping in my room. Soon one morning, death come a-creeping in my room. Oh, my 
trouble don't last always. I'm so glad. Trouble don't last always. Oh my Lord, 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 what shall I do? Amen. Amen. Yes, how beautiful, Mrs. Williams. And thank you so much, Betty, for sharing a young woman who dared to make a difference. Now, I am sure there's some historians here that know that in 1874, Mary Ann Baker wrote the song, Peace Be Still, sometimes known as Master, the Tempest is Raging. The lyrics were based on Mark 4, 39, and Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. The lyrics of spirituals such as Peace Be Still performed by Reverend James Cleveland and the angelic choir of First Baptist Church of Nutley, New Jersey carried hidden messages. After all, it was 1963, a year that witnessed the March on Washington and the use of high pressure fire hoses on our youth protesters in Birmingham, Alabama. Churches used musical spirituals to protest and beseech God to calm the raging waters of American injustice and brutality. We believe that even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, we still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. Let's lend an ear to senior warden Emerson Cooper as he pays tribute to a son of America, a peaceful warrior, as well as Charmaine and Miley Suleiman and Sean Shilaloui, Shiluli, sorry, who pay homage to trailblazers who have made the dream reality. My name is C.C. Aran. I am an author. Technical difficulty. One moment. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I was like, wow, senior warden change. I know. <laughs> We're, that's because senior I'm, I'm, warden is, is doing his live. That's um, correct. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Martha. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Dr. Rogers. Uh, Dr. King, I'm not going to read his entire speech. Uh, I'm just using excerpts of his speech of August 28th, 1963, which was the I Have a Dream speech, and also excerpts uh, from his uh, speech to the 11th Annual Southern Christian Leadership Conference on August the 16th, 1967. Uh, just excerpts to see uh, if you can follow exactly what Dr. King thought. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time. Now this is a speech done in 1963 and see how much it pertains to us today. To lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negroes legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. 
But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold, which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence there to that day, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone, and as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is a victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York or New Jersey believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, 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 we're not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Now, from the 11th Annual Southern Christian Ship Leadership Conference, Dr. King asks, where do we go from here? First, we must massively assert our dignity and worth. We must stand up amid a system that still oppresses us and develop an unsaleable and majestic sense of values. We must no longer be ashamed of being black. The job of arousing manhood within a people that have been taught for so many centuries that they are nobody is not easy. Even semantics have conspired to make that which is black seem ugly and degrading. Yes, in Roger's thesaurus, there are some 120 synonyms for blackness and at least 60 of them are offensive. Such words as black, soot, grim, devil, and foul. And there are some 134 synonyms for whiteness and all are favorable expressed in such words as purity, cleanliness, chastity, and innocence. A white lie is better than a black lie. The most degenerate member of a family is the black sheep. Aza Davis has suggested that maybe the English language should be reconstructed so that teachers will not be forced to teach the Negro child 60 ways to despise himself and thereby perpetuate his false sense of inferiority. And the white child 134 ways to adore himself and thereby perpetuate his false sense of superiority. Let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Let us realize that William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. Let us go out realizing that the Bible is right. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This is our hope for the future, and with this faith, we will be able to sing in some not too distant tomorrow with a cosmic past tense. We have overcome. We have overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall Come someday. Thank you.
Martha, you have to unmute. You are having technical difficulties. <laughs> My name is DC Aran. I am an author of romance novels and a trailblazer for the great state of Georgia. I ran to be the governor of Georgia in 2018. I ran a successful campaign in 2020, registered voters, which led to the state turning blue. I am the dream. This is just I am the dream. My name is Kamara Harris. I am the vice president at the Biden States. I am the dream. I am the dream. I am the dream. My name is Barack Hussein Obama the second. After graduating Columbia University, I work as a community organizer. I obtained my law degrees from the Harvard University. I was the center of illness in 2008. I became the 41st president of the United States of America. I am the dream. And now we're gonna have the selection by Philora Williams. Oh, fix me. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Senior Warden and our youth. Aren't they just phenomenal? They are our next trailblazers. Let's watch them work. Now, civil rights allow people to live freely, guarantee equal opportunities, legal protection, and the ability to participate in society without persecution. Mr. Hubert Lambert expounds upon a politician and diplomat who is an activist working on civil rights, which regulate the way our government must protect us from discrimination. And we also have Miss Rosie Avery, a notable writer of poetry who will share her original poem, We Are Strong. Hello, church. My name is Andrew Jackson Young. 
I was born March 12, 1932, in New Orleans, Louisiana, to parents Daisy and Andrew Young Sr. My education began at Dillard University in 1947 and on to Howard University, where I gained the Bachelor of Science in 1951. I became a minister after attending the Hartford Theological Seminary in 1955. I was married to Jean Childs, of which bore three children. I became a pastor at Bethany Congregational Church in 1957. But in 1961, I resigned from the church to become a civil rights activist, joining my colleague, Dr. Martin Luther King at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957 where 60 ministers met for the appointment for the abolishment of legal segregation via nonviolent protests such as bus sit-ins, boycotts, and freedom rides. I was also the executive director and president of the SCLC, a principal strategist and negotiator of civil rights campaigns for Civil Rights Bill in 1964, which helped enforce constitutional right to vote preventing discrimination for federally assisted programs such as equal opportunities and help the enforcement of the 15th amendment prohibiting the federal government from denying a citizen the right to vote based on race, color or servitude. In 1972, I became the first black man elected to Congress from Georgia since reconstruction in 1863. I was twice re-elected Democrat to Congressional 5th District, 1973 and 77. I was also a diplomat and US ambassador to the United Nations elected by President Jimmy Carter in 1976. 1981, I became the mayor of Atlantic, Atlanta and brought the 1996 Olympic Games. I'm also an author of several books and the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I'm currently teaches at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at the Georgia State University in Atlanta. I leave you with my quote. It is a blessing to die for a cause because it is so easy to die for nothing. Excellent. My name is Rosie Avery, and the name of my poem is We Are Strong. Four little black girls were killed in the church a long time ago. There were many who were happy, and they let the whole world know. Many years later, a brother by the name of George Floyd could not breathe. He called out to his mother, and on earth, he had to leave. Through generation after generation, we have shed many tears. Our tears are still flowing after all these many years. So working hard in the cotton fields to become the first black president of the United States, we are still enduring ra racism, fear, crime, and hate. When the morning sun greets us at the start of every new day, we thank our precious Lord for always making a way. Should we shudder? Should we flee? No, because our ancestors stood strong, determined to be free. Kamala Harris has made us all very proud with her sneakers and her beautiful pearls. She is a true inspiration to all our precious little girls. We are a strong and mighty race. One month can't tell our story. So we must stay strong and fight the good fight until God calls us all home to glory. We are strong. Nice, very nice. Thank you, Mr. Lambert, for sharing an esteemed civil rights activist who has received so many accolades. Ms. Avery, thank you for such a thought-provoking and encouraging poem, which is so needed during this season. Standing up for change, women have continually fought for civil rights, whether resisting slavery 
or speaking out against racism. Women established organizations to improve the conditions of all Americans. They worked in politics, labor, and education to form the backbone of the modern civil rights movement. Women served as the critical mass, the grassroots root leaders, challenging America to embrace justice and equality for all. Ms. Deborah Atkins brings us scholarship on such a woman. Good afternoon, church family. I was born in Richmond, Virginia on March 24th, 1912. When I was five years old, my family moved to Rankin, Pennsylvania a steel town in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, where I attended racially integrated schools. My mother was active in the Pennsylvania Federation of Colored Women's Club and would often take me to her meetings. While in high school, I became socially and politically active in anti-lynching campaigns of the 1920s. I was accepted at Bonnet College in 1929, but did not entrance because the school had an unwritten policy of admitting only two black students per year. So I enrolled in NYU where I earned an undergraduate degree in 1932 and a master's in educational psychology the following year. I became a social worker with the New York Department of Welfare where it taught me that the skills to deal with conflict without intensifying it and transformed me as, a, as an activist for civil and women's rights. I later became a counselor at the YWCA in Harlem. While working at the Y, I met Mary McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt at a meeting of the National Council of Negro Women held at the YWCA. On that fall day, I remembered so vividly, Mary McLeod Bethune put her hands on me. She drew me into her dazzling orbit of people in power and people in poverty. The freedom gates are half a jar, she said. We must pry them fully open. I was committed to the calling ever since. I continued to work for the YWCA and joined the national staff, joining the program staff with special responsibility in the field of interracial relations. The momentum of the civil rights movement prompted the WISE National Board to allocate funds to launch a countrywide action program, which I headed for two years. I retired from the YWCA in 1977 and was elected as an honorary national board member, a lifetime appointment. I was an active member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and was initiated at the Road Chapter at Columbia University. I served as national president of the sorority from 1947 to 1956. I became president of the National Council of Negro Women in 1958 and remained in the position until 1990. While working with both the YWCA and the National Council of Negro Women and participating in the civil rights movement, I organized Wednesdays in Mississippi with Polly Spiegel Cowan, which brought together black and white women from the North and South to work against segregation. I developed an international volunteer program with NCNW in Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. I received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Bill Clinton in 1994. President Barack Obama called me the godmother of the civil rights movement, and I was an honored guest at his, at his inauguration on January 20th, 2009. I received numerous awards and honors, too many to mention. That does not matter. I want to be remembered as someone who used herself in anything she could touch to work for justice and freedom. 
I want to be remembered as one who tried. I died on April 20th, 2010, at the young age of 98. My name is Dorothy Irene Height. And now we will have a song by Mr. and Mrs. Tommy and Denise Wortham. You will need to unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, Judy. Are you here? Us? Okay. This song I remember singing when we came to church, and all of us were gathered and just to hear us sing together, praise God together, hand in hand. This song lifted us up when we were going through summer civil rights. I love this song. My mom sings. I was thinking deep in sin. I was falling on the peaceful shore. Then I would stay with me. I was seeking to rise. No more. Then the master of the sea heard my spirit cry, and from the water he lifted me. i 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Adkins, for sharing. Um, women are consistent in lifting as we climb. And thank you, Tommy and Denise, for such a beautiful song. Now, as well as advancing the cause of Black Americans, many used music to share the cultures of other countries and to benefit the labor and social movement. Canon Morris Anderson shares the accomplishments of a linguist who amongst other talents sang songs promoting world peace and human rights in 25 languages, including Russian, Chinese, and several African languages. Canon Anderson. Paul Robeson, the singer, actor, athlete, and activist, died at age 79 on January 23rd, 1976. Robeson's physical strength, size, and grace made him one of the elite sports figures of his generation. But his statue in other fields, music, theater, politics, human rights, eventually overshadowed his athletic greatness. On stage and screen, his unique voice earned him universal artistic acclaim. But when he raised it in support of civil rights and social justice, his voice often aroused violent controversy. Paul Leroy Bustill Robeson was born in Princeton, New Jersey on April 9, 1898. The son of a father born into slavery and a mother raised as a very vocal abolitionist, Robeson's academic and athletic achievements earned him a scholarship to Rutgers University in 1915, where he became not only a fourth sport letterman and two-time All-American football star, but a member of Phi Beta Kappa and class valedictorian, all of this while being only the third African-American student in school history. Robeson moved to Harlem after graduation, where he worked his way through Columbia University Law School as an actor and professional football player. By 1923, Robeson had passed the New York bar and earned a critical raise on London and the Broadway stage. The lure of a promising career in law proved less compelling for Robeson than a career in the theater. Over the next 20 years, Robeson established himself as one of the most important musical and dramatic performers of his day. The role of Joe and the song Old Man River in Showboat were written for Robeson's famous bass voice. Robeson originated the title role in Eugene O'Neill's The Emperor Jones, and he became the first African-American to play Othello in a Broadway play. By the late 1940s, Robeson's international artistic reputation was well established, but it was rivaled by his reputation as a political activist. He was quoted as saying, in the early days of my career as an actor, I shared what was then the prevailing attitude of Negro performers that the content and form of a play or a film scenario was one of little importance to us. What mattered was that the opportunity, which came so seldom to our folks, later I came to understand that the Negro artist could not view the matter simply in terms of his individual interests and that he had a responsibility to his people who rightfully resented the traditional stereotype portrayals of Negroes on stage and screen. Racism generally and the horror of racial lynching particularly were Robbins, Robeson's greatest concerns. If his outspoken views on segregation didn't win him enough enemies in the United States, his openly leftist leaning certainly did. He expressed his passion for liberty simply, quote, to be free, to walk the good American earth as equal citizens, to live without fear, to enjoy the fruits of our toil, to give our children every opportunity in life. That dream which we have held so long in our hearts is today the destiny that we hold in our hands. Robeson traveled repeatedly to the Soviet Union beginning in the 1930s, a history that led to the unconstitutional seizure of his passport and his blacklisting following the appearance before the Joseph McCarthy House Un-American Activities Committee in 1950. When asked during those hearings why he did not simply move to the USSR, Robeson offered a typically powerful response. 
quote, because my father was a slave and my people died to build this country, and I am going to stay right here, and I have a part of it just like you. The answer to injustice is not to silence the critic, but to end the injustice, unquote. Robeson, like so many in the Black Lives Movement today, had a choice to be silent or to acknowledge a mirage of American equality, injustice, and fairness for all. He was singular in his brilliance and extraordinary talent and could have easily floated below the radar by staying in his place. His presence will be forever an integral part of Black history with his words and deeds forever in our collective wisdom. Thank you so much, Canon Anderson, for the great information on one of our esteemed history makers. And now by special request, I was wondering if Tommy and Denise Wharton would be so kind as to do another um, song for us tonight, today, this afternoon. They may have left. Oh, okay. <laughs> so moving on, the promise of freedom held out the hope of self-determination, educational opportunities, and full rights of citizenship. One of the more marked transformations that took place after emancipation was the pro pro proliferation of independent black churches and church organizations, associations. Churches provided centralized leadership and organization. Many political leaders and office holders were ministers. Churches were often the largest building in town and served as community centers. Groups like the Union League and fraternal organizations all used the regalia, ritual, and even hymns of churches to inform and shape their practice. Today, our churches continue to negotiate relationships within the community and the wider world. As we bring our program to a close, please sit back and enjoy a dance performance by Jemaya Armstrong, which will be followed by closing remarks and prayer by Canon James Wynn. We thank you again and again for joining us this afternoon. Many thanks to our participants we loved your creativity and talents. The spoken word and beautiful music was phenomenal. I would be remiss if I, if I did not mention again the hard work and dedicated service of Martha Johnson, Helen Bailoff, and the Christ the King tech team. We thank you, grace to you, and peace from God. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave And go home to my God Oh, my God.
this opportunity again to thank all of you who participate, but especially want to start with thanking uh, Dr. Sh uh, Sharon Rogers for your part in this and uh, pulling this together. Your leadership in this was, was outstanding and we greatly appreciate you so much. I give you a, a hand if you could see us. <laughs> and also want to thank, of course, Martha Johnson and Helen Baylock and their, their team and the the uh, team that handles all the videos and so forth and things like that is greatly appreciate. They do a great job with us keeping us on the Zoom in terms of church and stuff. Greatly appreciate it. And I'm so moved by all of the singers and again by our young people. I'm so glad to have you involved in, in uh, being a part of this. Please keep going. Please be a, continue to be active in, in the ministry, uh, you know, why we're in this pandemic. And above all, you know, we know you, we love you, and we do appreciate what you are doing. So all of you who participated and um, uh, read uh, of, of some of the greats of our past, we appreciate you in being part of this. It, it was a great, great, wonderful program. And so that the best thing we do is, is close this with a, a wonderful word of prayer and a doxology. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your blessings this day, for this chance, as always, to gather holy in your name as we celebrate our Black history. Continue to guide us and strengthen us in all that we must do, join together and be part of this wonderful ministry. And now we say, go forth into the world in peace. Be strong and of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil but instead show the love that Christ has shown to us and the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of God's son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, rest upon you this day, remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you all for being part of this. Thank you all. What a great job. Great job. What a great job. Thank you, Thank you, Doc. Thank you, 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 Yes. Thank you to Justice and Noble. Oh, Thank you yes. for everyone. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you good for that job. task. You oh, and Helen really did a good it. job and your team. Yeah. Thank you guys for you found your second career. <laughs> Thank you for pulling together a beautiful program. It's just really great. I'm glad everybody came out. Yeah. Thank you. We'll so see you much. next on Saturday Night Live. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming out, participating. And it, okay, look at Helen, folks that work. And I just wanted to acknowledge our sister, Rancelina Roberts, who mm -hmm. always works at getting um, Black history information out to Christ the folks yes. every year. 
our hearts and prayers at this time, Vanselina, and we just wanted to acknowledge you all. Amen. She and our mother and all the prayers. Somebody has some um, feedback. Feedback. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, hi, Mildred. You look beautiful. <laughs> it's so oh, my. <laughs> Thanks to all our visitors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful program. Yes. Thank you for Laura. Oh, if my God. Here. No, she's Thank gone. you, Betty. Remind we're on Zoom every Sunday at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, African Canon. African Canon, you look good in that uniform. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> yes, he does. I see that. I see how that is great. <laughs> I'm going to make you a king very soon. I'm trying to play the part. That's all I bet. <laughs> I like that hat. I love that hat. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. 